Hi, this is Mr. Max with Sun Kofa Mathematics. So I'm looking at paper two, the much awaited paper that uh, everybody has been asking me to upload because I'm so busy, but I think today I find time to do this paper. Right, so um, very important that you perhaps also realize there are some instructions and information that are key whenever you are working through these papers. One of them that are key is you're supposed to round or give your answers that are not exact. You must give them to three significant figures. And if it's decimal, if it's uh, degrees, uh, angle sizes, of course we work with degrees. You must give them to one decimal place. So as a given, when you're doing the exam, make sure your calculator is in degree mode. Your display there it will either be a DG or a D, depending on the calculator you're using. And make sure it's a non-programmable calculator, not this particular type, because this one has got some built-in equation functions and they are not allowed in the external examinations. Right, also they are giving you the value of pi is either you use the calculator value or you use the value of 3.142. Of course, I'm going to use the calculator value of pi and then give my answer according to the required rounding. All right, let's start um, directly with the first question. It says a bag contains 15 beads. So they are labeled with a different number, but they are 15. So they are labeled from one all the way up to 15. Of course, I'm just going to write them on top here. The numbers one up to 15, just um, for the sake of answering the question, uh, because we'll be asked to either take prime numbers from this, numbers that are divisible by three and stuff like that. So. Um, it is just going to be helpful if I can do that. So we know that there are 15 and this is probability. So the answer should be a fraction. And if you are now looking for square numbers, then you're obviously going to say one times one is a square number because one times one is one. Four is a square number because it's a square of two. Two times two gives you four. And nine is another square number because that is three times three, okay? And there are three of them, and then you can simplify this to one over five as a fraction. Please don't write three or the prime numbers down, but it's very wrong. You're working with probability here. Prime numbers are numbers that are divisible by itself, and um, one, so two is a prime number because two goes in itself. Ones and one goes there. 3 is a prime number, 5 is a prime number, 7 is a prime number, let's see, 11 is a prime number, 13 is a prime number. So there are 6 of them that are prime numbers there. All right? So please do not make the mistake of um, writing 1 as a prime number. We quite see that often. Okay, so 3 goes into 6 2 times, and 3 go into 15 5 times. All right, so the answer should be a fraction. The next one, numbers that are divisible by 3, that means 3 can go into those numbers without leaving a remainder. Of course, they could be a lot. Let me just write them down. Uh, 3 goes into 3, 6 goes into 3, or, or 3 goes into 6, rather. Um, 9 is divisible by 3, 12 is divisible by 3, and 15 is divisible by 3. So you realize there are uh, all of them, therefore, you have got 5 out of 15 numbers that are divisible by 3. Okay, again, I'll simplify that to a third. Five goes in itself once, it goes there three times. Of course, you can also leave it as 5 over 15, but rather let's simplify that answer. 
Okay, here's the problem. If you want out to use decimals here, 0 0.333 is a recurring decimal, and you might have problems there of rounding. So rather fractions. A number less than nine, well, numbers that are less than nine, there will be eight of them, obviously, because eight, seven, and six, and five, if you go down, they are all less than nine. So that one is a quite straightforward question. It will just be eight numbers out of the 15. And that can simplify, so I'll leave the answer like that. Then uh, the next one is a cube number. Well, if you look at cube numbers, remember, if I have to write them down, one is a cube number because one times one is giving you one. Then there's another cube number there. That is the number eight coming from two. So the cube numbers that I have that are within that range is one and eight. So therefore, there are two out of the possible 50 numbers are going to be cube numbers. Here's the one that you have to be a little bit uh, careful. A number that when doubled from those numbers from 1 to 15 gives an even number, which is also a multiple of 5. So let's take 5 from that. And if you double 5, you get 10. So 5 is an answer. Another possibility is 10. When you double 10, you get 20, so 10 is a possible number, and 15 itself, when you double it, you get 30. So the numbers really that we're looking for are the 5, the 10, and the 15. So if you were to take 9, for example, out of that list and you double it, you get 18, and 18 is not a multiple of 5. So therefore, you have to be a bit careful when you are working through that one, okay? So there are three numbers out of the 15 that satisfy this particular, which therefore also simplifies to one over five. All right, so that brings me to the second question. Anna traveled from Marinto to Oshikoku. For the first three hours, she traveled at 120 kilometers per hour. So that will be her first part. So we can say, all right, that is part one of her journey. So what do we know? We know that the first part, she did 120 kilometers in one hour. That is obviously the speed. And remember the journey for the first three hours. So that was first three hours because we're looking at a total distance, and remember, distance is calculated if you are familiar um, with kinematics, the study of motion. We multiply the distance to find the distance. You multiply the speed, in this case, 120 kilometers per hour. You multiply that by the time. So, obviously, if you do that, 120 kilometers. This is not um, three hour, three kilometers, but it's three hours. So when you multiply, I just want to point out what is happening here is that the hours cancel and you have 120 times three, which gives you that 360 kilometers. So that is the first part of the journey. Let's take the second part. And now it says she is doing 110 kilometers in one hour. All right, there's a one in front there. And she does this in six hours. Again, if I have to go cancel the H because I want to find a distance, this gives me 660 kilometers. Right, the total distance will be the sum of these, which therefore will give you 1,000 and 1,020. Let's just correct that bit. One zero two zero. This is the total distance that we required. The thing about average speed is that average speed takes into consideration the total distance. So that is the total distance, which we know is the one thousand and twenty kilometers. And we're going to divide it by the total time. 
And when you consider the three hours and the six hours, obviously, you'll have to add them. All right. And you can grab your calculator. So that is 1020 zero zero divided by 9. So, well, of course, you'll have some that bar means that fraction keeps on going on and on and on and on. But I can also shift and then I press that button again. So I like to work with, um, you know, the decimal value of equivalent of that. All right. So it's 113 and a third kilometer. Anything equal to that? I think they will also accept 113 because 113 is also two, three significant figures. Question three is very similar to question one, the fact that you are dealing with uh, probability, but um, you have to be a bit careful here. So there was a lot of probability questions in here. There are 11 cards, as you can see, and they spell the name there, educational. And uh, Eric picks a card at random, write down the probability that the chosen card is the letter N. So how many letters N will you get in this arrangement of cards here? Well, it's just one out of the total 11. Remember again, as I said, leave it as a fraction. What is the probability that he chooses a letter A? So we see that we have one, two A's here. So the answer will be two over 11. Not the letter U. Of course, now, educational is having a letter U there. So everything not this one here will be the rest. Okay? So the rest of them should be 10. 10 out of 11. Or ordinarily, we say, when we are finding not something in probability, you say 1, the total of everything, 11 over 11, which is just 1. Or oh, okay. So maybe I should just write it out so that get the idea. We know that I 11 out of 11 minus the one card out of that, all right, that is a U. That's where we get that, okay? So, but you will see that we write 11 over 11 normally is nothing but one. So, when you see, you work through that um, and you come across this topic, that is what you should remember. Anyway, um, not a particularly different question. Then, here's the thing. When it says the letter D or the letter T, so the moment you have an or in probability, the moment you have an or, it implies you must add. So let's see how many Ds are there. Of course, there's only going to be one out of the 11 Ds. How many Ts are there? Again, only one out of the 11 t's. Now we add numerators when the denominator is the same, so the answer is 2 upon 11. Now here's the thing. Part B, very tricky. He picks two cards at random without replacement, so he takes and doesn't put back. Find the probability that they are both letter A. Now we know from the first instance if he takes letter A, there are two A's, so that will be 2 out of 11. Okay? Now, because you're now doing uh, things that are being replaced and stuff or not being replaced, we're going to multiply. So if you take out, the cards are now going to be out of 10. So how many cards out of 10 will have letter A? There will be probability of 1, okay? So we multiply this, and of course now you multiply numerator with numerator and denominator with denominator. Well, I will just like to simplify that. Before I do that, um, so I'll just say, uh, of course, I'll just say, um, let's just change the color. I'll say two goes in itself once here and two goes here, obviously five times. So the answer is one upon 55. All right. If you multiply that out. Okay. We have a long way to go. So let's not waste too much time. Uh, we get to question four. This question here says the sides of a triangle are given all correct to one decimal place. The moment you are dealing with all correct, this means this there is a limit of accuracy with regard to these measurements. And you are now told minimum area. And minimum area refers that you must calculate the lower bound. Now, another thing we're noting is that the area formula of a triangle is half times
times b is times height. Since you are multiplying, and the rule is with multiplication, you're going to multiply the lower bounds of the lower bounds. So the area would be a half, nothing you can do that's part of the formula, but you'll take the lower bound of the base, um, so the base lower bound times the height lower bound, okay? That's what you're going to do in this particular case. So I wrote them as subscripts there so you can know. All right, so basically we just need a 3.6 and a 1.3 because this could be the height and this could be the base as long as they are perpendicular. So this measurement here has nothing to do with finding the area. Then when something is given to one decimal place, one decimal place is like 0 0.1. So immediately you start dividing it by 2. And once you divide that by 2, you get 0 0.05. And this is what we are going to subtract from each one. So 3.6 minus 0 0.05 would be now 3.55. And that would be my new height. So it's a half times, we'll have 3.55. So we just correct that one over there. And the same applies with the 1.3. Take away 0 0.05 from it. And that would be 1.3. 25. So the base there is 1.25. Okay, so you're going to multiply this out. And here's something that you must always remember. And from time to time, you'll see that I will refer to a textbook that you should use, all right, uh, in conjunction, because I believe that um, most of you are using the y equals mx plus c textbook and i'll be using that textbook to refer so you can go back to pages and then there's something that i want you to look at page 29 in this textbook because it's also a very important concept it, it is also highlighted you do not round so when i take because we are looking with limits of accuracy you do not round your answers on limit of accuracy so it's a half multiplied by 1.25 multiplied by 3.55. So what it is, is you are going to write either that fraction or you're going to write this whole decimal value, okay? So I'm going to write 2.21875, 2.21875. Please remember, do not round questions on limits of accuracy, okay? So common mistake that most of the candidates last year were doing, they were rounding this, and 2.22 was seen, and they lost marks there. Question five, well, of course, you have got a rectangle, and inside a rectangle, you have got a triangle. Of course, you should be able to identify this triangle, and uh, here's a problem we have with this, is the spelling of the word isosceles triangle okay so if my handwriting is not okay i can go ahead and type it out for you if you want but remember uh, it's isosceles triangle i've seen horrible horrible writing as far as that is concerned all right so um again let's just say it's something isosceles isosceles triangle okay please remember that i'm emphasizing that because i've seen horrible 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 um spelling when it came to that people are always making mistake and they have to somehow figure out what is it that you want to say okay all right as you can see um Software is acting up a bit, but don't worry too much about that. Um, that could be the answer. There's an error there. Don't worry, I'll figure it out. I want to continue without having to do any type of starting over the program that I'm using. Um, at this moment and then at this juncture, perhaps, you can also, again, as I was saying, um, just want to move that up so that at least, oh, no, doesn't matter. It obscures that, but I wanted to remove it.
All right, so they want us to find the parameter of MDC. So what is now important for us to do is we need to be able to calculate the distance of MD, which is equal to MC. Right, you are dealing with a rectangle. So this here is a right angle triangle. The little dash there says that whatever this middle line here, this is the midpoint, the distance of AB is equal to 8 centimeter because it's uh, opposite sides of a rectangle. So this is going to be 4 centimeter on that side. The same applies that to be 4 centimeter, and the same applies this to be 5 centimeter. So at the end of the day, you are working with a right angle triangle. Okay, so that is 5 here, and that is 4. And we are going to look for whatever this distance is. And in order to find that distance, you're going to use Pythagoras' theorem. And Pythagoras' theorem say um, that that distance there, I'm going to call it MC. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, okay, let's call that MC. MC will equal to the square root of, since the hypotenuse are looking, 5 squared plus 4 squared. So this is a uh, square root of 41 is 25 plus 16. And I'm going to leave my answer like that. So I'm just going to write in what I have now. So this distance here is the square root of 41. Similarly, that distance there is the square root of 41. So now they're asking you to find the perimeter. That's that distance of square root of 41 plus this 8 plus that square root of 41. So eventually we have got two square root of 41 that we are going to uh, add. So we're going to say the perimeter, okay, perimeter is going to be 2 of the square root of 41 plus 8, okay? Go ahead and use your calculator. You can say, well, square root of 41, go out, plus square root of 41, go out, plus 8, okay? That gives you the uh, required answer. Again, it's not an exact answer because you're dealing with... Uh, Irrational numbers, so we'll have to round our answer. So eventually, if I write down what I have, I have 20.80624. Remember well, 847. 847, of course, 20.8 centimeters to one or to three significant figures. They want us now to find the area of the quadrilateral M, B, C, D. That is the, um, if you have to look at it, that is, if I take away this, of course, just to see what they are looking for, they are looking for the area of this shape that I'm now shading. And if you know what that shade is, you can see that it's a trapezium, trapezoid, depending on which part of the world you are, okay, trapezium. So the formula to calculate the area of a trapezium is you add the sum of the parallel sides and you multiply by a half and also by the height. So the trapezium that I have marked out is kind of taking this type of shape over there. Never mind. Uh, drawing is not to scale. So that was 8. That was 4. And the height, if we have to go back, is 5 centimeters. So the height of 5 centimeters. All right. So you have that height over there, so that's 90 degrees over there. So you're going to take that and you're going to say, okay, 4 plus 8 multiplied by 5, you're going to divide that by 2. That is how you find the, um, the area of a trapeze, trapezium or tra trapezium. 4 plus 8 is 12, half of 12 is 6, 6 times 5. So of course this answer here is 30 square centimeters. Right, let's get to question six. Question six, a little bit of Venn diagrams, quite simple, straightforward Venn diagrams with a, a set notation. They're saying that the universal set is a set that all natural numbers that are less than 10. So basically, you can list them. Well, they are the numbers one up to nine. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay. Then we now have to complete this 
um, universal set. So first of all, I'm going to look at set A and B, and I'm going to see what is it that they have in common. Of course, they have a 3 in common, okay? So I'm going to write that 3 in here, the overlap. What else do they have in common? Of course, they have a 4 in common as well as a 6 in common. So in here, I'm going to have my 3, my 4, and my 6. Doesn't really matter how you write them. Now, if you look at B, this is the set. So 8 is the only one that is now left. So you write in that region. When you look at A, you have got 1, 2, and 7. 1, 2, and 7 that comes over there. So everything else will be written outside in the, in the sort of the universal set, in the enclosure there, that rectangle. So we know that the numbers is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to 9. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is not there, so I'm writing it outside. 6, there, 7, 8, so it's 5, as well as 9. So just find a way and a place where you can write that. Then, uh, again, if uh, you have problems with these questions, uh, go to page, this particular one, page 73. The union, A union B means A and B together. So basically, shading means you are going to shade the whole of A and the whole of B, okay? Everything that is in, in step uh, set A, also everything that is in set B. That's what you're going to do. Please have a look at uh, page 73 to look for that particular one. So A, complement this one here. Well, this one here says, um, I'm going to write it here, all elements... Okay, in the universal set that are not that are not in set A. Okay, all right. So again, if you have the textbook, go to page seventy-four. Perhaps you are going to get an idea. Okay, if you have a problem with that. So everything uh, in the universal set not in A. So A will be left totally uh, sort of untouched or unshaded. So you're gonna go ahead and shade everything else except that set A, okay? Right, you can do it nicely in pencil, um, as long as you get the idea of what I'm doing, all right? So everything, and that one's the only one that we leave open. Again, as I said, not too much of a problem. Question 7a, so we do a little bit of algebra. We have to make y the subject of the formula. So I'm going to write the formula as 2 pi root y equals to t, because I want the y to be on the left-hand side. So root y equals to t divided by 2 pi. That is if you get rid of that. So of course, eventually, you're going to have y is going to be, now you're going to take the opposite of the square root, which is the square. So you're going to take t over 2 pi, and we're going to square that. Okay, right, so you can also go ahead and uh, you can, if you want to, you can go ahead and leave the answer like that, or you do find other people who go further, not necessary though for this level, they can go further and say, okay, t squared is t squared, and 2 squared is 4, and pi squared. I hope it's clear. Either one will give you the two marks. Right, so um, simplify, so this is 2b over 3 multiplied by 1 quarter. I hope you remember that uh, if you're dividing by something, it's the same as multiplying by its inverse. So, of course, 2 goes in itself. 1 and 2 goes here, 2 times. So, I have a b on top there because b times 1 is just b, and 3 times 2, well, that gives you 6. Please let your b and your 6, let they, don't, they should not look the same. Um, again, you can go ahead and uh, you can also say uh, 1 over 6 and a b there, still the same thing. Right, whenever you are doing part um, part C, remember the instruction is told to simplify. So we're going to multiply everything that is outside with everything that is inside. So negative 4m is going to multiply with 3m. And negative 4m is going to multiply with negative 2. Now here's the kicker. The first part, no problem. This is negative 12m squared. 
But now you have to be very careful. Whenever you multiply a negative with a negative, the answer becomes a, a positive. So 4 times negative 4 times negative 2, negative 4 is going to be positive 8m. So I'm just going to write my answer as 8m minus 12m squared. Of course, it doesn't matter if you write it the other way around. I just want the, the positive term to be up front. Then you have got a base that is raised to multiple exponents, and the rule is you are supposed to multiply. Okay, so we are going to multiply all of them together. All right, a half times a half times that uh, negative 32, okay, is negative 8. So one half times one half, which is a quarter, times, of course, negative 32. Well, that gives you negative 8. So, therefore, the answer here is x raised to the power of negative 8. Again, I'll give you the reasonable doubt if you go, say, 1 over x raised to the power of 8. Of course, if you don't want to write your answer with a, with a negative indice or index. Part C is a simple equation. You can actually do this in your head. Okay, 2 times something divided by 3. Take away 8 gives 0, so maybe you say 2 two or 2x two over 3, perhaps move that 8, then becomes 8 over 1. Because if you take this 8 to the other side, it's going to be a positive. So here now, you can do um, cross multiplication if you would like. So cross multiplication, that is 2x times 1, it's just going to be 2x, okay? Um, so do multiply this together, and I'm going to multiply the 8 times 3. So 8 times 3, well, that's 24. And in order to get x, then, you will be saying x is going to be half of 24. Therefore, our answer will be 12, okay? Just make sure that our 12 is written nicely. Again, many ways you could do this question as long as you get to the answer straightforward you can go ahead and test it if you are unsure 2 times 12 is 24 24 divided by 3 is 8 8 minus 8 gives you 0. question 8 you have a little bit of um, circle geometry okay uh Euclidean geometry again as i said is not really uh if you have done the topics you should always make sure that you are covering at least the basics of any topic so we are dealing here with points a b and d a b and d they lie on a circle d also exact they lie on a circle the center o is here there's very important that reason angle dac is 38 degrees as you can see angle a c B is 28 degrees. They say find with reasons angle BAC, angle BAC. So it's this particular angle over here. Now, the reason why we are so interested in that angle, and I've indicated, is that this is an angle in a semicircle. Okay? So you have got a right angle triangle because that passes through, you have the passes through the center, and that A could have been here, for example. And if you were to join these two, it will still be 90 degrees. As long as that A moves, it will be 90 degrees. So that is 90 degrees. And the reason for that is angle in a semicircle. Of course, angle in a semicircle or a semicircle is equal to 90 degrees. So you can go ahead and just write angle in a semicircle. Well, is equal to 90 degrees whatever reason that you give as long as it makes sense find angle abc abc of course we can calculate this angle very easily if um, this triangle abc all well, the angles give you 180 we already have a 90 over there so we need to find this angle by simply saying okay 90 degrees minus 28 degrees or Someone else can say, well, to find that angle, I'll say 180 minus 90 minus 28. All of these will give you the same solution, okay? So um, if you say 90 take away 28, of course, you get for 62, 
all right? Or, or you would have said 180 minus 90 minus 28. Of course, it's also 62, all right? Because the angles in the triangle should always add up to 180 degrees. So this here is 62 degrees, okay? I'm going to write that uh, down here. So we say it's 62 degrees, and we can say angle angle sum of a triangle okay of um triangle let's say abc and writing is horrible today but you get it and the reason is it adds up 280 a d c they want us to find a d c so it is that one over there here's something that you need to know this and these points a B and C and A, B, C, and D. They are all on the circumference and there are four points in the circumference. So that becomes what we call a cyclic quadrilateral. And here's the thing, quadrilateral. A cyclic quadrilateral is a quadrilateral that touches the circumference in four points, okay? The opposite angles there of a cyclic quadrilateral, they must add up, they must add up to 180. So that being said, in order for me to find angle D, I would say 180 take away 62, okay? And that is going to give me that answer there because opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral are supplementary, means they simply add up to 180. So that was 180 minus 62 degrees of course grab your calculator it is 118 degrees and we say opposite angles of a cyclic quadrilateral um, opposite angles of a cyclic c quad the lateral cause they add up to 180 degrees, or you can use the word they are supplementary if you want to be uh, using that terminology. All right, question nine, you have to factorize. It is not an equation. Please don't solve this. Um, the equation part comes at part two. Um, very important that you understand this. So we have got that uh, quadratic trinomial that needs to be um, sort of factorized. So, well, you look for two numbers when you multiply them together. Those numbers should, that not, should not give you 10. And if you add them, should give you negative 7. Another thing, what I also know is that both my brackets will have identical negative signs because if this is a positive, then whatever will be in the bracket will be identical to whatever the middle term is. So the two numbers multiplied together happens to be negative 2 and negative 5. So not, not a problem. So I've got 5x squared because you can check negative 2 plus negative 5, all right? That gives you negative 7. So it's very easy to find those factors. All right. So I'm going to take the factors and I'm going to arrange them so that I can easily factorize, perhaps changing this. So this is negative 5x, negative 2x. So this is what I'm doing to the term in the middle in order to create those four terms plus 2. So we have got four terms and we're going to now sort of factorize them in pairs. So what is here? Common is 5x, and you have x minus 1. And here what is common is negative 2. Inside we have x minus 1. So eventually, in my answer will be 5x minus 2, and the other one will be x minus 1. These are the, factored, um, are the factors of 5x squared minus 7x plus 2. Now, if you look at this equation, there is no need because of the word hence. And this is what I want you to always remember. There's no need for you to go and say, use the quadratic equation formula and stuff like that. It's two marks, you're wasting time. Whenever you see the word hence at the beginning, okay, 
of a question. You are supposed to, we expect you to derive the answer um, from the previous part so of the question. So basically, we're going to use the previous answer, which is 5x minus 2, and then x minus 1, let it equal to 0. In fact, if you were to look here, you say 5x squared minus 7x, and if you bring that minus 2 over, it becomes a plus 2 equals to 0. Can you see that this equation is on the left side is exactly the same there? So these 5x squared minus 7x plus 2 are equal to 5x minus 2x minus 1. So it's already in its factored form. So here's the thing. Whenever you multiply any two numbers or any two things and you get 0 as an answer, it implies that one or the other is equal to 0. Okay? So I'm writing here because of space. So basically, 5x equals to 2. Then x will be 2 over 5 here. Or x, my, x equals to 1 over there if you take it over and solve it like that. No need for the quadratic equation. Express as a single fraction. Here's the thing. Number one rule, whenever you are dealing with uh, algebraic expressions and stuff like that, Always put the expressions in brackets. The LCM is just what you have over there, x plus x plus 2. Just write them together. Of course, this is a sort of cross multiplication. But you have here, you have an x. And what you're going to have here is you have x plus 2. So on a numerator, we're going to have x times x and minus, well, you don't have to put that one there, x plus 2. Okay, we can go ahead and uh, sort of uh, multiply out the brackets. Very careful when you multiply here, you're going to have minus 2. And do not multiply out the numerator, okay, or the denominator. Of course, this is the answer that you can do, or if you want to go further, you can factorize the numerator, but the answer is just x squared minus x minus 2 all over x and then you have x plus 2 uh, in the brackets and please remember the brackets very important so here maybe under here we have space let's look at that numerator there which is um, x x squared minus x minus 2 if i was to factorize the numerator okay if i was to factorize the numerator two numbers when you multiply them, that's a negative, so one will be positive, one will be negative. And you multiply, it give you negative 2. Okay. Um, continue. When you multiply them, give you negative 2. And if you add them, should give you, um, I guess, uh, negative 1. So the answer will be negative 2 and 1. So you can see, that's what that numerator factorizes to. So, if someone was to write the answer as x plus 1, x minus 2, all over x and then x plus 2, this is still all right. The thing is, there is nothing common, so you can't really um, sort of, you can't really sort of cancel out common factors. And remember, you can only cancel out common factors if you have one term on top divided by one term underneath. The most the most biggest problem that we see with students is that they go and cancel out things that are on top while you have got different and various expressions. Okay? And also, do not use it. A, a, when you're dealing with multiplication, don't use it times. All right? You'd rather put brackets, which is going to be very helpful. So the equation simultaneously of course you have to remember that one of these equations is uh, quadratic y equals to x squared and uh, the other one obviously is linear so what you're going to do is you're going to make one of these letters x or y the subject of the formula so if i was to make um y the subject of the formula for example so i say y equals to 12 minus x so that's what happened over here and everywhere where i have got an a y okay i'm going to replace that y by say by this 12 minus x so 
I'm going to take this answer that I have here, all right, that represents y, and I'm going to replace it in the other equation. So that equation now becomes 12 minus x is equal to x squared. Of course, this can be written as x squared equals 12 minus x. So of course, that is x squared. That becomes plus x minus 12 equals to 0. This is a, a very straightforward quadratic equation that can be solved um, if you were to solve it. Of course, negative 12, one bracket will be positive, one will have a negative. Two numbers multiply give you 12, negative 12, it has to be 4, and it has to be 3. The 4 being positive and the 3 being negative. All right, let's just go ahead and work here. So that becomes x plus 4 is equal to 0, or x minus 3 is equal to 0. In this case, x equals to negative 4. We can put one answer there. In this case, x equals to 3. We can put one answer here. Now, let's just go back and bring y equals to 12 minus x back, or the other one, depends on you, in order to find the y value. So when x is equal to, when x is equal to negative 4, and you must be very careful, you see what I did there, this is going to come 12 minus negative 4, and it's very important that you, that you don't make mistakes with your signage, because you can easily... Uh, make an error, then this answer is 16. Another one, when you use the same y equals to 12 minus x formula, now you, sub you substitute 3 in there, so y equals to 12, take away 3, 12 minus 3, of course, that gives you 9. So, corresponding values, where they need to be, and those are your solutions. All right, takes a little bit of work, but you can actually get the work done. All right, question 10b, evaluate log 1,000 plus log 100 without using a calculator. Of course, um, you can write log 1,000. There are many ways you can do this. Log 1,000 can be written as 10 uh, cubed plus log 100 can be written as 10 squared. And then you use the power law where you put the, log, the, the power in front of the log. And I'm going to do the same over here. Now, here's something. The assumption here is when you are just having log and then the number, the base is actually 10. And the rule that you need to know is that log base 10 of 10 is always equal to 1. The same like log base 5 of 5 is equal to 1. So this here is nothing but 3 times 1, if you look at this plus 2 times 1, if you look at that. So eventually, the answer becomes 3 plus 2, which therefore gives you the answer to our problem as nothing but the, the number 5. Again, you need to show this working in order for you to get those marks. Don't just grab a calculator. We need to express this as a single logarithm. Now, one of the things that is very important here is that the number 1 um, can be written log 10, because I just said log 10, log base 10 of 10 is 1, plus 2 log x plus log x plus 1. Of course, there are still some other things I need to do. I can take away this 2 and it becomes log x squared plus log x plus 1. So here's the thing. Now, when you are adding logs of the same basis, you multiply the numbers. So this becomes then log in brackets. I have 10 times x squared times x plus 1. Of course, that is all you can do. There is no need for you to sort of um, multiply out. So that's 10x squared and inside we have x plus 1. And that is the final answer. So let's just make sure that our things are written neatly, x plus 1, and then we close that bracket. Of course, um, a lot of mistakes. Just be very careful. Revisit log loss. Question 11. Well, um, this is a horror show of a graph, the fact that it's so big. Okay. Um, so I'll minimize, but I'm going to scroll up and down. The owner of a bookshop drew a graph 
of the number of books sold each week during a certain period. So on the y-axis, you have the number of books that are sold. It goes all up the way 140. On the x-axis, for example, you have the weeks. So we now know week one, he sold 60 books, as you can see. Week two, all the way up there, he sold 120 and so on and so on. So the lowest number of books sold, that's what they ask, determine which week or the week, okay, where the lowest number of books were sold. So um, another thing when working with graphs, you must make sure that you understand the scale. So here you have got 20 books, but it's from, if you count, there are 10 of that. So 20 divided by 10 equals to 2. So each little square or a block represents two books, okay? Very important that you understand that. And when you look at the, the the weeks, well, of course, it's not important because I don't think the answer will lie outside of that. So it's okay. The lowest number of books sold, um, if you look at week one, I'm going to minimize this just so I can squeeze in. Again, as I said, it's horrible. Week one over here, 60 books were sold. Week two. That's 120, 120 also in week three. Week four, well, there we go. I think it's halfway between uh, 80 and 100, so let's just make it bigger. So we are now over here. So week four is going to be here. Okay, it's two, four, six, eight, ten. All right, so that's 90. So this becomes 90, that is also 90. Well, this is 60, and then it shot up again up to 90, and then it came down all the way under here. So remember, it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 10. So which week sold the lowest book? Of course, that is very easy. It's where the graph is on its lowest, which is uh, week 8. Okay, next question. So I'm going to go back and forth. There's no difference in sales made from one week to the next. Of course, this is when you now have your, your graph is just sort of stationary. No movement, okay? So the first one is here. That is 120. The, that is week two and week three. So I'll write that down. So week two, two, three. To week three. That is one condition. Then... Um, Perhaps put that down in brackets. And another one um, where it was also stagnant. Of course, here where you have only sold 90 books, that was from week four to week five. Okay, so that's the other answer. The other answer would be um, week four and week five. Okay, and week five. You can also do it like that. These are the um, answer. The highest increase in sales, so now um, you have to look at week-to-week -week basis. If you look at highest interest in sales, we are only interested in the part where the graph goes up. So I'm going to highlight that part so you can understand. We are only interested in this part where the graph goes up because this is in, it implies a peak. Okay, an increase in sales. So it's only week one to week two that we're going to look at. And also, what week is this? Where you have the 60, of course, that's week 6 to week 7. So let's see what the number of books were. So I'm just going to change. I'm going to work over here. So here you have 120 minus 60. Of course, this gives you 60 books that um, it went up with. And obviously, here you have a, a minor 90 minus 60. Of course, it's just 30. So this is not representing the highest increase. So the correct answer, which week, it has to be from week one to week two. Okay, week one to week two. So we'll say week one to week two. That has been the highest increase in sales. They say find the percentage decrease in sales between seven and eight. So let's look at what week seven was. Week seven, the sales was at 90. Week eight is at 10. So 90 and 10. So we're going to say the difference 
is 90 minus 10, which is 80. Then the percentage decrease, percentage decrease is always that difference. Of course, we're going to multiply it over 100%. That difference, but over what? From week what? From week seven to week eight. So we need to go look at what was the sales at week seven. Week seven, the sales were um, ninety. So it has to be over ninety. All right. Originally, what it was. All right. And then you just go ahead and you multiply that out. Okay. So let's bring in our calculator. So you have got eighty upon ninety. Simply multiply that by hundred. Don't have to do equivalent fractions, of course. All right, 88.88888, of course. Um, that can also be written as 88.9. So 88.9 to three significant figures. They're asking you the total number of books sold in the eight weeks. So, well, of course, I have recorded them. Um, it is obviously the 60 here, plus the 120, plus the 120, plus these two 90s over here, plus the 60, plus the 90, as well as the 10, okay? So just go back and forth and make sure that you remember them and you write them down. So I'm going to add them and uh, I'm going to write them down. So we said it's uh, 60 plus, there were 220s, I remember. Then there were two 90s, I remember. Then there was another 60 and another 90, as well as another 10. Bottom line, the answer is 640. Okay, question 12. A grain silo is a cylinder with a hemisphere on top. All right, so if you know this is called... This is called a sphere. A hemisphere is the half of that. Are you with me? So the hemisphere represents half, half of that. So that's what we're looking at. So the top part is a hemisphere, which is half of a sphere. The cylinder has a diameter of 12 meters and its height is 13. Okay, so from there to all the way down there, that's the 13. Now, the first part, you'll also see from the question paper that you have, you will not have this formula over here that I've added. And that is the surface area of a sphere. If you go to your syllabus, they will give you the formula for the volume and the total surface area of a sphere, a pyramid, and a cone. So 4 pi r square represents the surface area of a sphere, okay? Like that whole sort of tennis ball thing that I drew over there. So if you have to find the total surface area of a hemisphere, you have to take that formula and divide it by 2. Similarly, if you are working with volume and you have to take the volume of a sphere, what we have over here, and divide it by 2 because we are now working with nothing but a hemisphere, okay? Very important that you... Are supposed to remember that so the surface area of the sphere wasn't given and i've included it over there but anyway they say the height of the silo not the height of cylinder the height of the cylinder is nothing but 13 meters the diameter of the uh, cylinder is 12 but then the radius would be six you agree so that means that the distance all the way up to there will also be six so if I have to add that distance over there, that's also going to be 6 centimeter. So the height of the silo has to be that 6 plus that 13. Very important that you understand that. So the height of the silo is nothing but 19 meters. Now they are asking the curved surface area of the silo so could be that over here my my uh, question paper they say the curve surface area i'm just going to write it out so you can know what is it that they're looking for they say the curve surface area of the silo and very important that you understand that so i'm gonna because i brought in something so i'm gonna go to the next page so 
the curved surface area of the silo is the curved surface area of the cylinder, which is that part, all right, goes around. That part goes around. When you cut it sort of open, like I've indicated over here, it creates it creates this sort of rectangle where you have 2 pi r times the height. The 2 pi r comes from the circumference of a circle. This here, this, this here is a circumference which is 2 pi r. And when you cut it open, you have the height over there. So when you multiply these two things together, you get 2 pi r h, which is the formula, the curve surface area of a cylinder. Good. What do we know? We know our radius is 6. We know the height of the cylinder was 13. So the curve surface area will be 2 times pi times the radius 6 times the height of 13. Okay, so let's just get in our curve surface area of the cylinder. Cylinder. So we're going to have 2 times pi times 6 times 13. So that's 156. So I'm leaving my answer in terms of pi for now. What else do we now know? It's not the only thing that is curved because it says the curved surface area of the silo, not the cylinder. So we need to find the curved surface area. As, I, as you can see, I've removed the curved surface area of the hemisphere. That means we need to find that curved surface area over there as well. Okay, not the one inside. Of course, you can say the one inside, and say it's a rectangle. I mean, it's a circle. We uh, and it's sort of part of the shape, so we are not going to find that. We just want the curved part. So I gave you the formula. The formula for the surface area of a sphere is four pi r square. So the formula for the surface area of a hemisphere will be four pi r square, but divided by two, which gives you two pi r square. So this is the hemisphere, all right? So that means if I have to come down to the hemisphere, the surface area of the hemisphere is 2 pi r square, which is now 2 pi. Our radius we know from before, our radius was nothing but 6. So that is 2 pi r 6 squared, which is 2 pi times 36, which is nothing but 72 pi. Do we have it? So in order for us to find the total surface area, we are going to add those two together. Okay, so our total surface area will be 156. So I'll go back here. Uh, in terms of pi, it's 156 pi plus 72 pi. Of course, grab your calculator. Then you have 156 pi plus 72 pi. Of course, that gives you 227 pi. Or, narrowly, because you have to leave your answer, you can leave your answer as uh, 713. Oh, so I made a mistake on my calculations. Let's just go back. It's 156 pi, not 155, plus 72 shift pi. Okay, that is 228. 228 pi. Uh, very careful with uh, this type of uh, calculations. Of course, you can also leave your answer like that. It will totally be acceptable. Uh, or you can leave your 716.28, 716.28, and so on and so on. Since I must give my answer to three significant figures, um, that will be, um, of course, if you if you have to play around with it, that gives you 716. 716 is also an acceptable answer. Okay, but it normally will give you a range to work with. Here's the thing. They are now looking for the volume of the silo. Here's the thing that you now need to understand. The volume of the silo, uh, you can sort of look at the volume of a cylinder. Okay. So when we are now doing volumes, 
what you need to know is the volume um, volume of volume of a cylinder is nothing but 2 pi r square h okay um, the reason why um, that's the formula for the volume of a cylinder if if you have i need to take away that two over there so i can just explain something proper so you have your cylinder right you have your cylinder so the surface area of the cylinder this here the surface area that's a circle okay um the surface area of a cylinder this part it's pi r square it's a it's a circle then the height of that is there because whenever you have a prism it's the area of the cross section in this case the area of a cross section for this one is a pi r square is a circle then you multiply that simply by the height and that is the formula that we use over there so i'm just going to get rid of that so that i can include what i can do because i'm not done so in this case it's pi we know the radius is six and we know the height of the cylinder is 13 okay so again we have got 13 times 6 times 6 is 36 times pi okay i can it's 468 pi so that is 468 pi and i'm not done with that okay now after the reason why i included um or they included the formula they gave you the formula for the volume of a sphere which is which is this formula over here which is the formula 4 over 3 pi r cubed so i'm going to write that formula down here in my analysis so you have got the volume of a sphere but i'm now looking for a hemisphere hemisphere so that formula that i have which is 4 over 3 pi r cubed I'm going to divide that formula by 2. And I hope you know why I'm doing that. And if I divide that formula by 2, it's the same as multiplying by a half. Okay? So it's like, I'll leave the pi r cube out. So just for your information, I will take the numbers, 4 over 3. And if you divide it by 2, okay, you get nothing but 2 thirds. All right, so that gives me 2 over 3 pi r cubed. So the volume of the hemisphere will be 2 over 3, or that formula divided by 2 pi, and my radius was 6 cubed. Okay, so let's just punch in and see what is that answer. So that answer would be 2 over 3, again, as you can put the whole thing in and divide by 2, times pi times the radius of 6 cubed, okay? I'll leave my answer in terms of, that's 144 pi, so that's 144 pi. So the volume would be this 468 pi plus 144 pi. And I'm simply gonna add them together in order to find the volume of the silo. So the volume of the silo will be 468 pi plus 144 pi. Okay, so you will then go ahead and say, okay, plus 468 pi, well, that gives you 612 pi. So 612 pi is the correct answer. Of course, you can go ahead and you can leave the answer and uh, you can write down 1922, 1922.0, well, that was 654, 654, and so on. And to three significant figures becomes one nine two zero, and they will normally in the examination accept a, a acceptable range, because not everybody uses the same value of pi. You might be using three point one four two as indicated in the beginning of the question paper. All right, so I guess that you revisit this one and uh, and you check out uh, the stuff. Um, 
even when you are now dealing with this formula that I have brought in, um, the formula for the surface area, okay, the formula for the surface area. So perhaps you can look at page in your textbook 528. Okay, you will have an idea there when you are given the surface area of a sphere. But remember, when you have a hemisphere, it's half of that. So you can't be using that formula just blindly. You have to divide it by two. Right, question 13. Um, this is uh, matrices. Again, straightforward matrices. And the reason why maybe sometimes the uh, students did not answer this in the exams last year was because maybe you didn't finish the syllabus. So again, it's very important that we finish the syllabus and you only spot papers and, correct, uh, and, and, and do revision towards the you know beginning of the year. A, B, you multiply the two together, of course. Um, when you multiply, you will have to take the first row. Now, remember, you have got rows and columns. I'll put a C here. That's column. And an R here. That's row. Okay. So we're going to multiply in this way. And I'm going to write here 2 times 1 plus negative 6 times negative 3. So I'm taking row. Can you see that? This first row. And I multiply it with a column. Okay. And both of these things are two by two matrices. So my answer should be it's a two by two matrix times a two by two matrix. So the resultant matrix must be whatever you have in the middle, which is a two by two matrix. So there must be two by two matrix like that. Okay. So row one times the first one. And I take the first row and I multiply it with the second column. So two times zero. Okay. Plus negative six times negative four. You with me so far? Then we do the second one. We take this second row, multiply by the first column. That's seven times one plus three times negative three. Are we together so far? Then we take again that seven with the second column. Seven times zero plus negative three times negative four. Of course, we can go ahead and clean this up. So here we have 2, and this is negative 6 times 18. 2 plus 18, that's 20. Okay, perhaps I will write them in here. That's 20, that first uh, element there. When you go to the next one, you have got 2 times 0, that's 0 anyway, so you can just ignore that. So negative 6 times negative 4, that's 24. Again, you have got 24. You have got 7 here plus, but now you have a negative 9. So negative 9 plus 7, that gives you nothing but negative 2. And here you can ignore the 7 times 0, so that kicks care of that. So you have got 3 times negative 4, which is negative 12. Of course, do check out more of my solutions where I even show you how to do these things with a calculator. All right? Um, my work on matrices. But, for example, um, if you look here, you'll see that there is a, a matrix sort of um, function of a calculator. And uh, you can actually use that to do matrix calculations. All right. Um, do check out all my videos that I have done on that. Um, or I can show you the setup. So you go to mode. I don't know if your calculator will have that. That's the thing we say about non-programmable calculators. But I'm going to go ahead and I choose 6 for matrix now. I have matrix A, matrix B, and C, so I want the calculator to remember. So matrix A is going to be replaced by the number 1. And matrix A is nothing but a 2 by 2 matrix, so I'm going to choose uh, 5. And I'm going to enter the, the elements of matrix A. That's 2, negative 6, 7, 3. So that's 2 equal to negative 6 equal to, and then I have 7 equal to, and 3 equal to. Good. I can actually close that. And I go again to my setup, and I choose again 6, and I choose 2 for matrix B, and it's also a 2 by 2 matrix, and matrix B, I'm now going to go ahead and say, okay, the elements, that is 1, enter 0, enter negative 3, enter negative 4, enter. So this is the ones for matrix B.
okay i can actually clear that but it's in the calculator so what i'm going to do now is going to go to setup uh and i'm going to say or i'm going to say shift four okay to bring out the matrix so i'm going to have matrix a which in this case is three must multiply shift four again by matrix b which is that so my answer you'll see that 20 first element 24 negative 2 and negative 12 okay of course you have to um, show this type of multiplication and that's why you have all that space for the working all right good let's go to the next question so of course uh, these ones are not that problematic you just say twice um, whatever you have from matrix a so every element in matrix a and matrix a have got two remember negative six seven and three and we're just going to multiply each element there by two so times two times two times two times two all right and we're going to add matrix b which is one zero negative three negative four all right so this gives me um four then negative twelve then 14 then 6 so we're going to add that with 1 0 negative 3 negative 4 again do not use that space there i'm just doing it for effect because i'm running out of space of course now it's simply a matter of you adding the corresponding elements with each other okay so that means you're going to add the 4 and the 1 okay that gives you 5 over here the negative 12 and the 0 that gives you obviously negative 12 corresponding elements together um, I have to show step by step the 14 and the negative 3 that's 11 okay so that's 11 and then the next one there that I'm going to add is the 6 and the negative 4 and the answer is 2 okay so that is 2 over there again you can also do that in a calculator, but there's no need for that, okay? When you add, you just simply add uh, corresponding elements with each other. Good. Then part B. Find X and Y if you have got that scenario. So again, using the concept of adding the corresponding elements or equating the corresponding elements together, that creates an equation over there. Then the second one, is 5 plus y equals to 15 that also my second equation if you look at this equation i can actually solve for y y would be 15 take away 5 so y is nothing but 10 okay so if that is the case then some x plus 10 should give you 6 that implies that x should be negative number so that is 6 take away 10 well that is nothing but negative 4. Right. Part C, you are supposed to use a matrix method to solve. I had to bring in a blank page because there's a lot that we need to do and then to unpack. Also, this is five marks. So if you were to use a different method and not using matrix method to um, solve the simultaneous equations, you lose marks. You only get the answers, the two marks for the, if your answers are correct, though. So you then lose marks um, without... Um, you know the other three marks for the method that is required um i also will suggest that you go to in your textbook you go and look at page um 567 on how to work with the inverse okay the determinant um for you to look at this as well as page 569 maybe uh, also to help you out with solving this type of questions relative to what they are then it's very important that um, i'm going to write the elements um, so i'm going to say if a matrix a so i'm just going to write the elements is one so let's use another bracket can either be square brackets or this one um, Okay, goodness, that disappeared. Good, let's go back. 
I just wanted to clean this one up. And then I ended up cleaning everything else. That's one for this one here. Then the Y one is two. Then I have a three here. Then I have a negative five. So that is my um, set A. Then, one of the things that you need to understand is to solve this, we need to say that set A, okay, multiplied by x, y should give you 9 over 5, or 9, 5, like that, okay? That's the first thing that you need to understand. So, whenever you want to get rid of this set A, you need to multiply it by its inverse. So we need to know what is the inverse of that. But there's also something called the determinant of a set. And the determinant of a set, or sometimes it can be written like this, is when you are taking the diagonals, like you say, you take 1 times negative 5 subtracted by 2 times 3. Okay? 1 times negative 5 minus 2 times 3, those diagonals there. That answer is going to be a number. In this case, the answer is negative 11. So that's the determinant. That's the first thing. The next thing that we are going to do before we use the formula is we are going to find the inverse of a set. Now, the inverse, and I'm going to see if I have time here. Um, so we know what set A is. So the inverse of set A must be 1 over that determinant multiplied by. So we are now going to, so if, say, set A, let's say set A has got the elements A, B, C, D, then you are going to swap the elements here, D and A is swapped, and C and B gets negative or the inverse, whatever, if it is a positive, becomes a negative, for example. So the sign on those two changes. That is the inverse of a set. So we swap A and D, therefore, if we have to look at our inverse or our determinant, so in this particular case, uh, I just want you to, maybe I'll go under, because I don't want to use too much space. Um, so we have calculated um, our determinant to be 1 over negative 11. Not a big deal. And uh, if you swap our A, which is uh, this here, 1, 2, 3, negative 5, you swap the 5 and 1. So you're going to have negative 5 and 1 swapped. You can also look over here. That is the same thing. So negative 5 comes on top and 1 comes here. And these two, they, they are both positive, so they become both negative. Right. This is the inverse in a nutshell of the set. So maybe um, I can just go ahead and multiply that stuff out. So I multiply so everything. So like negative 5 times negative 1 over 11 becomes positive 5 over 11 because you have a condition of like a negative times that. And negative 1 over 11 times negative 2, that becomes 2 over 11. And this times that becomes 3 over 11. Okay, um, and of course, you have that times that becomes negative 1 over 11. All right, so this is my inverse of my matrix A. So from, from what I have now over there, um, I have the scenario, what I wrote here, I have the scenario that this obviously is going to leave now x, y, equals to, so I'm going to rewrite that as x, y, I'm going to say equal to, and I'm going to take you back there so you can follow exactly. But I'm not going to use this particular part, so I'm going to use, so sort of this, this, this is being multiplied by its inverse, so when you multiply by its inverse, x, y will be left alone, so what you do here, you should also do on the other side. So I'm going to bring that inverse to the other side, but it must be written before the 9, over 5. So I'm going to write this 
1 over negative 11, uh, negative 5, negative 2, negative 3, 1, and not that version. And obviously here I'm going to have my 9, 5. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply first these uh, two sets here before I multiply with that negative 1 over 11. So I hope you still remember how you multiply. So we're going to go row, column. Okay, so x, y equals, let's leave negative 1 over 11 for now. So it's negative 5, we're going to multiply. I'm going to write them down here, negative 5 times 9. Okay, plus negative 2, okay, times 5. And then I'm going to come down to the next one, negative 3 times 9, plus 1 times 5. All right. Okay, good. Nearly done. See if I still have space, of course. So I'm going to have xy is equal to negative 1 over 11. So if you now have to do this multiplication of the stuff inside the bracket and addition, negative 5 times 9 is negative 45. Negative 2 times 5 is negative 10. Negative 45 minus negative 10 that gives you negative 55 in the first instance. And if you now do the numerator, let's just grab power there so we don't lose power altogether. If you do the numerator, negative 3 times 9, that's negative 27 plus 5. Negative 27 plus 5, that gives you negative 22. That is negative 22. So this is why I kept on leaving that negative 1 over 11. Because now if I multiply negative 55 with that, is the same then as sort of dividing. So that's going to be negative 55 over negative 11 and negative 22 over negative 11. You, you see that? So basically, at the end of the day, I'll have my answer. So that gives me x, y would be equal to 5 over 2. Therefore. X is 5 and Y is 2. Okay, I suggest that you do go back and uh, step by step and revisit again as I was giving you the page numbers for you if you are struggling. Um, but of course, I have also done plenty plus of these type of videos on my YouTube channel and you can go ahead and you can check them out. Okay. All right, that brings me to question 14. By completing the square, find the coordinates of the turning point of the curve. Now you are being told here by completing the square. Okay. All right. So um, maybe you will not have too much um, space there. So I'm just going to write down that question over here. So it's negative x squared minus 6x plus 7. That is what um, y equals to. So we're going to complete the square. So first thing that I'm going to do, because I'm using my method, I'm going to say y minus 7 equals to negative x squared minus 6x. That means I took that 7 over that. And I'm going to take these two that I have. I'm going to say y minus 7. I'm going to take out negative 1 as a factor. So that will be x squared plus 6x. Because it's negative, if you distribute it, that's what you're going to get. Take out negative 1 as a common factor. Now, I already know what the value of a is, so I need to complete the square. So what I do in order to complete the square, I take half of the middle term, half of 6x, half of 6, and you square that, okay, this here. So half of 6 is 3. Before I square, what I have now in the bracket would be negative 1, I'll have x plus, that's a positive, if it was a minus, then you would have seen it's a minus, plus 3 all squared. So basically, I have squared that. Even if you multiply this 9, this 9 is already added in there. And this is the thing that I want you to, to, to take note of, okay? Um, if you were to multiply out x plus 3 times x plus 3, you'll get x squared plus 6x plus 9. So that plus 9 is not there. Can you see that? 
So I'm going to subtract that 9 there because otherwise it's going to spoil the, the show. So before I bring back, um, I'm going to multiply by this value over there in order to make it through. So this is y minus 7 equals to negative 1. x plus 3 or squared plus 9 now because I have to follow that. Please do check out my videos on how to complete the square using this method. So eventually, it is now y equals to negative 1. I have got x plus 3 all squared plus 9. Bring the 7 back. So what you are now left with is, and I'm going to write it here, you are now left with y equals to minus 1 x plus 3 all squared plus 16. The turning point is this value here, it's opposite, that will be negative 3, comma 16. Turning point is always the stuff inside. You say, you take that stuff, let it equal to 0, so you can say x plus 3, let it equal to 0, and then you have x equals to negative 3. That's how you find that value. should be familiar with that, okay? Right, so if I go back and I, and I rewrite it, I have got negative 3 over here and 16 over there. That's the turning point of the graph. Something also that I'm going to show you is this formula x equals to minus b over 2a. And I don't know if you are very much familiar with the quadratic equation formula. But if you are familiar with the quadratic equation formula, which I'll write here as x squared, uh, it's x equals to, uh, it's, let me first write it out what it is. So it's minus b plus and minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, b squared minus 4ac, everything over 2a. But what does everything over 2a mean? Well, it means I can write them separately. I can say, okay, wait a minute. It therefore means this over 2a and that stuff over 2a. But if I'm just looking at this part, this part gives me a value which is here. That is the excess of symmetry. That means if you have your graph, this way is going to be halfway between whatever your graph will be. So if I was to sketch this graph, and because remember that's a minus, so for example, if I was to sketch this graph, um, and I will just sketch it anywhere, so if I was to sketch this graph, this answer that I'm getting from, from using that formula, that will be half, that will be the x's of symmetry. That will be x equals to negative 3. And that answer, you can go ahead and, and test it out. So I don't want to be too technical, but let's use that formula so that maybe you can use that instead. But of course, you have to show the, the formula, or uh, the completing the square. Our a is here, which is negative 1. Our b is here, which is negative 6. That is 3 divided by negative 2. Not 3, but 6, rather. So you have got 6 divided by negative 2, which gives you negative 3. Voila. Now, if you want to find the 16 using this formula, then you take the negative 3, and you are going to substitute into the original equation. You're going to put everywhere. So you're going to say y equals to minus, minus, plus 7. So if you were to put um, negative 3 in here and in here, you will see that you will eventually end up with that, with that um, 16. But this is like, you know, you are kind of... I don't know, skipping some steps because the instruction was very clear that you are supposed, you see where the 16 comes from, that you are supposed to complete the square. So what I was doing on the other side, the other um, table over there, or the other page was very important. And you need to follow on how to complete the square. And uh, there are quite enough uh, similar like, um, what you call it, uh, examples that I've done. Okay, so let's just go back to what we have calculated. It was y equals to minus x. I'm going to write it here. 
So I have got the what I calculated was y equals to minus, then that's a negative one by the way, so perhaps I should just put it back. So that's minus one, and then you have got x plus three all squared plus sixteen. So this can also be an equation. This can also be written as an equation. You don't have to use the quadratic equation formula after that because you already have it. So what do I want to do? I want to know where will this curve cut. First, I can see that minus refers to my curve will take this shape because a is less than one. It's a negative number. Okay, a cannot equal to one. All right, so that's the curve. But I need to know where will it cut the x-axis. So I'm looking for the x-intercepts in order for me to find the x-intercepts. I need to solve the equation. I need to find the solution of the equation. So this is now negative 1, x plus 3 all squared is equal to negative 16. That is if I take the negative 16 over the equal sign. Then I have x plus 3 all squared equals to 16. That is negative 1 divided by negative 16. I get rid of that square by taking the square root, but I'm taking the positive and the negative square root of 16. Right, so this is going to give me two solutions. So I've got x plus 3 equals to 4, or x plus 3 equals to negative 4. So if I do solve this one, x is equal to 1, or x is equal to negative 7. So wherever negative 7 and 1 would be, that's where it's going to cross or cut the x-axis. This one here, the 7, this is where it's going to cross the y-axis, the y-intercept. Or you can find the y-intercept um, by making every value of x to be equal to 0. So now I also know where it's going to cross the x axis, not the cross, what is the axis of symmetry? What is halfway? It's x equals to negative 3. So, this is what I'm going to do before I sketch. So, I'm going to bring in a dotted line somewhere over here, and I'm going to say this is the line x equals to negative 3. Okay, perhaps I'm just going to move it a bit. All right, just a little bit, make it a bit smaller. All right, so this is the line x equals to negative 3. This is the axis of symmetry. Now, it's not all that straight as I would want it to be. So my axis of symmetry, negative 7 will be over here, and 1 will be over here. And let's suppose 7 over here. So it's for me now to draw the graph in there. Okay, so you will now know, okay, wait a minute. It's halfway, so the graph is going to go all the way. So it's kind of difficult, all right? But I'm just going to move my points anyway. So this is x. This is the turning point, the way my graph is drawn. The turning point will be here. It will be negative 3, 16, for example. So 16 will be the highest value over there. But I have done it on the other page so that you can see, okay? So this is how that kind of look like so what you're going to have over here would be the seven what you're going to have over here would be the negative seven and here is the one okay and if i have to bring in my dotted line there that will be my axis of symmetry can you see that it'll cut it exactly nicely so this is uh, also important that you perhaps know that this is the turning point so the turning point here is negative 3 comma 16 as you can see all right so you do get a mark then obviously the shape of your graph your mark for your intercepts that is where the four marks are coming from so again i just brought in that dotted line there just to explain the concept of the axis of symmetry okay halfway from the left to the right the roots very important and uh, once you have labeled all the necessary points and indicated negative 7 where the x-intercepts are and the 1 and the y-intercept of 7 and the curve is smooth then you don't have that problem so if for example now this is me this is say my crosshair okay so in the exam this is how it is because you don't have the technology to play around with this stuff um, 
I just want to make that one a little bit smoother. Okay, it's just moving. Okay, so let's say the crosshair is like that. So first things first, I know my graph has to be more to the to the left. All right. So it's a matter of just you drawing that and go turn and bring it back down. You're done. Then you have your negative seven over here. You have your one over there. You have your seven over there. Please don't write y equals to seven because y equals to seven is a horizontal line. Okay. And that's it. That's all that you need to do in the exam. And um, that solves the question. Yeah, I've got my three points. Yeah, I've got the curve. It's smooth. Don't try to put the points there first and then they'll go to the graph. You're going to struggle with it. Okay. All right. So that brings me to question 15. Um, question 15, obviously, you have uh, transformations. And um, of course, it says on the grid, you are supposed to draw the image of the following transformations of shape A, and then you have to label them. So first of all, we're going to do the vector, translation of a vector. So that's, the vector is minus 9, 4. So that is the x direction on top, and under is the y direction. So I take any point. I can take this point. If the x is negative, then you go on the left. So I'm going to slide to the left. And the y is positive, I'm going to go upwards. So if I was to take this point on my A, I'm going to count. Make sure you understand the scales. Every block represents one unit, so no problem. So I'm going to go nine ways to the left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, goodness. Nine is over here. All right. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I go four places up. One, two, three, four. So that's the new position for this one. So that other one is two places away from that. So it's going to be over there. This one is one up there. It's going to be over there. That one is two up. So it's going to be over there. Not a big deal. You can't be struggling too much with that. So the new shape is obviously going to be something like so. And then you can go ahead and you can label it B. So translation by that vector. Two marks for that. Please don't forget your um, labeling. Then it says we're going to rotate that 90 degrees clockwise and the center is here now this is the center so we're going to rotate the whole thing so this whole a is going to be rotated 90 degrees okay so what you do over there is um, first of all this point will be shared and uh, it, it, it kind of makes a, an L okay so this is now down two units down so it must come two units up can you see that so it goes down right and now remember it went up so the whole thing turned so this is what is down there now changed so this two that you see it must make an l so it has to go two ways that way so two ways that way can you see that and this one here again goes up so it has to go sort of down like this one way and then you simply just combine Bottom line, you'll see that it sort of changed shape. And then you're going to go ahead and you label this one um, D, as they say. Okay, That's the rotation. Two marks for that. Now, they say um, the rotation, um, no, but they say describe fully the single transformation that maps A onto C. A onto C, well, you can see as clear as daylight it's enlargement please don't write enlarge write it in full you lose marks it's enlargement okay don't say large whatever bigger it's enlargement make sure you understand and you know your different transformations that exist now you need to give the center of enlargement okay so also the scale factor the scale factor can be calculated very easily all right you just take corresponding sides so for example don't take horizontal uh, sort of, you know, uh, skew sides. Take this side, for example, maybe this side here, and you divide it by that side there. Those are the corresponding sides. Or I could have taken that with that. Okay, but I can't use this skew one because then I have to use Pythagoras and all kind of weird stuff. In any case, if you look at here, if you look at it here, you're going to see that you have got three blocks here and you've got one block here. 
Is it not the case? So if that is the case, when you divide 3 by 1, that gives you a scale factor of 3. So the scale factor, that thing is 3 times bigger than the other one. So the scale factor will be 3 over 1, which is nothing but 3. Now, we need to find the center of enlargement. And the center of enlargement in this particular case, it's going to be a coordinate point. So we are going to draw corresponding um, sort of lines, corresponding size. Let me just clean, clean this so that we can see. So of, uh, of A onto C, A onto C, okay? A onto C. So if I take my ruler, I take this point of C, maybe I'll change the color as well. Let's take that point of C and we join it with this point of C and I continue, continue, perhaps like so, depending on um, up to date, perhaps. And if I take this one and I join it with the other one, well, I can do the other ones when you see they will be all on the same thing. Can you see that the center of enlargement is here? 6, 1. All right? That's the center of enlargement. Right. So my center of enlargement is 6, 1. Okay. Three marks for everything there. Um, there's no angle stories there. Please make sure you know how to describe enlargement. So I have already done it also on the software. And you can see exactly um, how I've indicated it. I'll give you a minute or so to have a look at it. Okay. All right. So that takes me. Well, let me give you one more minute for you to stare and see how is it that I arrived at that question. All right, so please do play around with uh, your transformations and make sure it's always in the exam, you understand. Question 16, um, the second term, the second, the sixth, and the ninth terms of an AP, are uh, the first three terms of a GP, find the common ratio. Hmm. Well, uh, this question is a bit tricky. The fact that the space here that is required to do this question is not so sufficient. So I've brought question 16 over there. So I'm just going to try to, uh, to copy that question over and see if I can. Uh, um, we just maybe take. A... Yeah, you also have you also see how I do my stuff sometimes if you look at that. So. Let's say we take a picture. Okay, there's the tools. Anyway, edit, insert, file, insert. Okay, let's do that. Let's have you ready. Don't mind that, you know, it uh, does that. I just have to open the document again. So luckily, I uh, I also saved it. All right, sometimes you do have these small glitches and so on that appear. I'll be, uh, let's restore. Okay, right, so you see that we haven't lost any work. So I'm going to come back to this question, see if it will work this time around. So uh, my tools, there we go. I want to take a snapshot. I'm not going to crop anything. So I'm just going to take a snapshot of this question over here. And I'm going to say, save it as an image. So we just say 
question 16, I'll just say 16, all right, 16. And then I'm gonna save it on my desktop, all right? So I'm gonna save it. Okay, so that brings me now to the clean page. So what I'll do is I will now insert, I will now insert an image. So from the desktop, I said 16, there we go. Of course, I want it like that. So here we are. I think now the question is ready and I think we can now have a look through it, okay? Right, so it says the second, let's just make sure, good, there we go. The second, sixth and ninth term of an AP, are also the first three terms of a GP. So let me just write term one, term two, and term three. These ones will be a GP. Now, when you are dealing with uh, uh, a GP, you should know that, um, very important, uh, a GP, the first term is A. Next one, obviously, you know, you have to do a a first three terms, ah, the second, the sixth, and ninth term of an AP. Good. Let's let's do that first before we write this GP stuff down. Oops, my question disappeared. Let's bring you back. All right, there we go. So maybe if I if I do take away, I should maybe do it under so I don't. Okay, there we go. Just ignore that stuff on top because now you see what it does. It's taking away my beautiful lines that I've introduced. Anyway, I'm going to ignore that part. I'm going to come to the second term. Let's talk about the second term of an AP. Remember an AP, an AP is given by the formula A plus N minus 1 times D. So if you are now saying the second term, that is going to be A, plus 2 minus 1 times D. So the second term is nothing but A plus D. Are you with me? Then the sixth term, the sixth term will be A plus 6 minus 1 times D, which is A plus 5D. Are you with me? Then the ninth term, T sub 9, will be A plus 9 minus 1D, which is A plus 8D. Now, these are also the first three terms of a GP. So, if I now have to write my terms down for the GP using the information, so I'll say that my first term of the GP, which is A plus D, I'm going to put them in brackets, the second term of the GP is A plus 5D, and the third term of the GP is A plus 8D. Are you with me? Right. Now, whenever we're dealing with a GP, we need to find R. And our R is calculated by taking the second term divided by the first term, which should equal to the third term divided by the second term. So this is what I'm going to do here in order for me to find my R. So I'm going to take the second term, which is in this case is A plus 5D divided by the first term, which is A plus D, should equal to the third term, which is A plus A D, should equal to the second term, over the second term, which is A plus 5 D. We cannot ca cancel. So we're going to cross multiply in order for us to have that. So I'm going to say cross multiply over here, so you can know. So eventually I'll have A plus 5 D times a plus 5d to clear the fraction equals a plus d very important that you put them in brackets a plus 8d please you should follow clearly now this is four marks there's quite a lot that you need to do right if you multiply out here you have got a square plus 5ad plus 5AD plus 
d squared equals a squared plus 8ad plus, that is a squared plus ad, that is d times a, plus 8d squared. Are we together? Right, I can just clean it up a bit. So this is a squared plus 10ad plus 25d squared equals to a squared plus 9ad plus 8d squared. Right, I can also realize I have the same thing on the left, the same thing on the right there. I'm going to cancel out eventually. Then I have uh, nothing but uh, if I bring my 25 d squared and I bring its friend over, the friend, which is 8, now going to be subtracted. Okay, then I have uh, another 10 ad. And I bring its friend over. I'm going to have a minus 9ad, and I'm going to let all of the stuff equal to zero. So far, so good. So of course, this gives me 725 minus 8. That is 17d squared plus ad. That is 10 minus 9 in the view of one equals to zero. Taking out d is going to be 17d plus a equals to zero. Then I have got two solutions here, because it's quadratic. Then I have d equals to zero, or 17d plus a is equal to zero. So from this one here, I can't use this one because this is invalid, okay? Because d cannot equal to zero. Remember, you can't have, uh, um, if it's zero and you replace it here, everywhere you replace zero of the D, you're just gonna have a nothing on top now. Nah? And so it'll just be one. You want the common ratio. So from here, my A is equal to minus 17 D. Are we together? Now we know what my value of A is. So I ran out of out of pages. Um, perhaps I can add one more page. Uh, just insert okay good right so let me just write down what I have now um, I know from my work before that my first term was a plus d my second term was a plus 5d, and my third term was a plus 8d. And I also know from the work that I have done that a is equal to minus 17d. So I'm going to replace everywhere we have an a with minus 17d plus d, minus 17d plus 5d, minus 17d plus 8d. Together. Remember, it's a GP. Right. So if you look at this one, this one gives me the first term now is minus 16D. The second term, we've got minus uh, 12D. And the third term here will be, of course, if you add those together, it's minus 9D. It's minus 17 plus 8. Right, so what does the question want us? The question wants us to find the common ratio. So how do you find the common ratio? So the R equals to the second term should equal to the over the first term. Should be the same as the third term divided by the second term. So what do we know what is our second term? Well, our second term is minus 12D over minus 16D. Okay, let's just simplify this for a minute. The negatives they cancel, the d's they cancel, okay, then becomes three quarters. Or we take the third term, which in this case is minus 9d divided by minus 12d. You will also see that if you were to cancel out, the negatives cancel, the d's cancel, and you still have three quarters. Therefore, therefore our answer. R is nothing but three quarters or 
0 0.75. Okay, again, as I said, this is a lot of work. It's not just something you, it will not fit into that space, can you see? That's why I had to bring in the extra pages. But I can also do all of that work in here. But remember, the examination, uh, you are not allowed to take a question paper along. But what you do have is you have got blank pages towards the end of the question paper. And on those blank pages, you can do this work to make it a bit easier. And then show whatever working that you need to show. Do not just write the answer three quarters in the answer place. But now you carry over the work. Because here where you have to deal with the, with the, with the quadratic equations, your, your algebra should be sound. Otherwise, you run the risk of making your life a bit very difficult over there. If there is somebody who knows how to find this in a much easier way, please do um, do send me a message so I can see. But of course, they are plenty plus. Uh, this is one of the methods that you should have used. All right, let's go to the next question. So it's still ahead. Um, I think this one has to do with, uh, um, with statistics. That is question 17. Um, Ironically, this is also the last question in this paper. Right, whenever you do this question 17, I will suggest that in your, your preparatory work, uh, you go to page 674. The reason why many students couldn't get to these questions is because they, um, they didn't really finish the syllabus. There are a few things that I want to bring across, okay? And... Uh, I'm, I brought in, maybe I can bring in a, a clean page and see if I have that clean page over here. I think I have it just over here. Question 17. Right, so I wrote down the page numbers in the book that you can use. So the first thing I want you to remember is what we refer to as the frequency density. The frequency density is you take the frequency. Frequency. And you divide it by the class width. Okay? We're going to look at the class width right now. Um, if, because the, I don't have to go back and forth, and I hope you understand. If I have to bring in another sort of table of values, and on this side, I'm going to call them the class width. So I'm going to write here class width. You find it by saying 5 minus 0, so that is 5. 10 minus 5, the class width is also 5. 15 minus 10, well, the class width is also 5. But 30 minus 15, can you see this is going to be 15, the bars are not the same. 40 minus 30, that is 10. And 60 minus 40, that is 20. That's the class width. Are you with me? All right, so when you take the frequency and you divide the frequency by the class width, for you to find the frequency density. So frequency density is the frequency divided by the class width. So I'm going to use that. For example, I'm going to take the first one. I'm going to say 3 divided by 5. Okay, That is 0 0.6. So I'm completing the table, 0 0.6. When you do the next one, you say um, the next one, we can go ahead and let's grab the calculator to make it easy. We take the frequency density is 9. We divide it by 5, okay? Let's take it to 9 over 5, 1.8, all right? So that's 1.8. The next one that we have, the frequency is 89. Divide 89 by the class worth of 15 equal to 5.933 recurring. So we'll just write 5.9. Okay, and the last one there, we're going to take the frequency, which is 16, and we're going to divide 16 by 20, and that gives you 0 0.8. 0 0.8. Are we clear? Right, I'm going to bring in another table later, but I just had to um, sort, of, um, sort of bring that in. Another thing we've no noticing with this next question is the modal class. The modal class, okay, um, the modal class is, now when you go up there, 
and I'll write it down here, is, let's use red. Between all these classes that you have, the one with the highest frequency density. Which one is the highest frequency density in those classes that you have over there? You agree with me? It is the one from 10, D is greater than or equal to 10, less than 15. Is it not so? This one here. So that is the frequency, that is the modal class. The one of the highest density. Very important that you understand that. Now, there is something else that I'm bringing in, and that is called the mid interval values or the midpoint. So I'm going to go back there where I have my um, so called, you know, my, 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 what do you call it? Yeah, my space. And I'm talking about, so first thing I'll write down, we spoke about modal class, and we said, is the one with the highest frequency density. Ooh, the handwriting is terrible, but you get the idea. Then the estimated mean, that is now what we need to consider, is you take the sum of the mid interval values, I'm calling them mid values, then you multiply that with the frequency and you divide that by the total frequency. Hmm. Okay, so um, basically I'm going to write that to say the mean equals to, don't worry about this terminology, the sum of the frequency times the mid interval divided by the sum of the total frequency, okay? Sum of the frequencies, so on top here it means sum of the frequencies times the midpoint, that is what that formula means, all right? And we're going to divide it by the sum of the frequency. So we'll go to the frequencies and we're going to find that. Now, another important thing is how do you find the mid value? So the mid value, and I'm writing it here, mid value, and hopefully I write my handwriting is nice now. We take the beginning, And I'll go back to the table and you'll see value of each group, of the group. And we end, we add it with the end value, value of group. And then once we did that, once we find the sum of that, and then we divide it by two. So I'm going to go back to my table and I'm going to do mid, mid intervals now. So. I'm going to introduce another sort of line so you can get what I'm saying. So that means I need space and I'll clean this part up. Okay. So you must follow. So I'm going to call this my mid values. And I'm going to do one. So we take the beginning value, which is like the zero. Okay. Zero of this group plus the five, which is the end value there, all right? And we divide it by two. So this answer here is 2.5. Are you with me? All right, so I'm gonna do that for each one, okay? Right, so the first one here is 2.5. So we're gonna grab our calculator and we're gonna do that so that you can easily see how I find my, my mid values, okay? So that is for that table. So we don't run out of, yeah. As long as it's easier for you to see the mid values, okay? So we'll grab our calculator, we'll go into the second group, beginning plus ending, five plus 10. 
divide by 2, 7.5. So again, you have this is 7.5. We do the next one 15 plus 10 divide by 2, 12.5. 12.5 is the midpoint, mid value. The last one, 15, not the last one, but the next one. You say 15 plus 30, that's 45. Half of it, more or less, 22.5. And if you continue this pattern, the next one will be 40 plus 30 or 30 plus 40, which is 70, half of 70, obviously 35. And the last one, 40 plus 60, 40 plus 60 is 100, half of 100 is 50. Right, why is that important information? Because to find the estimate of the mean, we'll have to multiply, and I'm going to try to see if I can squeeze everything. So I'm saying 25 times 3, the sum of, so it's that frequency times the midpoint, mid values, okay, plus the next one. Uh, it's not 25, but it's 2.5. Next one, 7.5 times 9, the frequency, plus the next one, 12.5 times 34. The next one, 22.5 times 89. The next one, plus 35 times 31 plus, well, I'm going to go into you here. And then the next one is 50 times 16. Right, all of these, all of these, all of these have to be divided by the total frequencies. If you add the total frequencies, the sum of the frequencies. So I'm just going to write them under here so you get the idea. The sum of the frequencies. Going to frequency 3 plus 9, going to your frequency table. So it's 3. This is the sum of the frequencies. The one here, 3 plus 9, plus 34, plus 89. Plus 31. Plus 16. Well, you can go ahead and uh, you can be, um, I don't know, you can be working them out. You should get to an answer of, uh, um, let's see, if I was to do that, 675 divided by 28. Okay. All right. So you should get 675 over 28. Of course, it is 4387.5 over 182. If you use your calculator correctly, well, you should get nothing but 24.10714 and so on, and 24.1. That's acceptable answer. Hmm. All right, so I'll need that table again in order to do the last part of the question. The last part of the question, um, if I come back, is on the grid, draw a histogram to represent the information on the table. That is for four marks. Now, I'll just quickly go back and uh, I'll try to go grab that table and be with me, bear with me um, while I do that because for space. So I'm going to say, okay, wait a minute. Let me bring in our tools again. And, uh, and I'm going to take a snapshot. So I want a snapshot, well, I can take it from here, of this table. Say, save as image. Will we say um, histogram? I'll just say he stole, and I'll save it on the desktop. 
and I will go back to that blank page or where I have my yes my diagram over here and I'm going to say well let's insert an image from the desktop we save that as histo remember histo here it is I say okay I want that over there there we go good hope you follow um it takes quite a lot i know we are at the end of the video so here's the thing the in order for you to draw the histogram you are supposed to now complete you have got a class width um and i'm just going to write in those class widths there so that you can be very clear so over here We'll have five, so one, two, three, four, five. So five will be here. 20, 30, everything else is clear. So the first one has to go up to 0 0.6. Here's the thing um, I've got one, two, three, four, five. So that's five. Um, and if I want to know what does one small block represent, you understand? So that is one divided by five. So one small block represents 0 0.2. And the first one from 0 to 5, from here to 5, should be 0 0.6. So that's 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So it has to be here. Yeah. Can you see that? It's just up to there. The next one from 5 to 10, 1 1.8. So that's 1.2468. 1 1.8 1 is over here. And that is the uh, the next one. So the one that I have to complete. All right. So obviously you can use uh, I don't know your pencil nicely. Just make sure that you have your bars nicely drawn. All right. So the next one, the class interval, the one that does not complete. The next one is from. Uh, 15 to 30 so is this whole block and that is 6.8 okay so that is 6.8 uh that's going to be 6 so this is 15 over here so 6.2468 is it level 6.2468 i think this one here should be a little bit wrong now we are on the wrong side so that one there should be we are saying it should be 6.8 now 6.8 has been drawn the one that we're looking for is 5.9 my goodness 5.9 so 5.9 so let's just make sure where 5 is um, 1 2 3 4 5 is here 5.2468 so 9 ish is somewhere there it goes all the way up to 30 all right so it's going to cover that little part over there all right um well so you can sort of shade whatever you have that is what is going to be covered all right and then the one from uh let's see um the one from 30 to 40 has been shaded already it's 3.1 as you can see we now have to do 40 to 60 the last one 0 0.8 so again, in order to find 0 0.8 is 2, 4, 6, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 is all the way here, uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 0 0.8 is all the way over there. Uh -huh. So let's bring in our line. I'm going to change the color of this line. So it has to be this one here, all the way up to there, all the way up to there. Of course, it's much easier if you are setting um, with the paper and then you can do you can do that and that's how you get four marks for each correct bar and uh, the table is very important because you have to use the frequency but you need to first find out what does one little block represent on the frequency density before you start with that okay so we have it here as well for you you can have a look and see so it's four marks and you have got the mark for each correct bar not the same width. Right, this has been a marathon. Um, again, uh, I hope it has been helpful. Uh, it's longer than usual. There's quite a lot that you had to that we had to do. 
please pause the video, share it, and go through it uh, with the question papers. Question papers can be downloaded. Um, I'll also include the link where you can download the question papers.